lead of children and youth uh, at UN Habitat um, at the Human Rights and Social Inclusion Unit, who is going to introduce uh, today's topic. So, Doug, over to you, um, and thank you for being with us. Thanks so much, and it's great to, well, great to have our partners here at UN Habitat putting on this event, as well as um, we see the many different uh, partners that we've had to make all this happen. I think it's uh, a, um, like Virginie, who I know we've worked together for many years and have probably worked together <laughs> over many different, uh, many different sessions, I think, that are happening during ECOSOC. It's really exciting. Ecos this ECOSOC Youth Forum, I just wanted to kind of pitch the tent here, has dramatically changed from last year, which was canceled, but then two years ago, in which oftentimes the forum was very limited in terms of who could come because you couldn't fly in and so on. This time we have a huge amount of opportunity for young people to join. And I think we really see that, that happening here. So big welcome to everyone. And then specifically on this, uh, this event, I mean, when we're talking about urbanization, one of the things that we don't talk enough about is transport, especially as it links to young people. Young people are dependent on transport. They're probably one of the biggest users of transport next to women and, um, we, and maybe intersectionally youth and women. And we see, we see really see the need to focus on that. And we've seen that happen specifically during COVID-19 where all the services that we thought were there, kind of the backbone weren't there for you, for people. And so transportation was one of those. And we're really, so we're excited that that's happening. Transportation also is really critical in this climate age. And I, I'm really excited to see that Chie um, Bastida is here to speak a lot on that issue, that we, we need to look at how transportation is going to not pollute, not destroy, not take up our public space and serves the whole, the needs of everyone. And then the last piece that I think is really exciting here and uh, uh, a real interesting uh, focus is indigenous people. Indigenous people, we often think of as living only in rural areas or living in, in far remote places such as the Amazon and which they do and they need to be protected, absolutely. But it's also indigenous people are massively migrating into urban centers and they're facing a whole range of bias. They're facing a whole range of racism. They're in some of the most impoverished uh, communities in the world. I come from uh, Canada. And if you look at many of the, the centers of our cities, I come from Vancouver. Again, it's, it's indigenous people and specifically indigenous young people that face this. So to bring together this very unique panel to talk about not only about youth, about transport, which is critical for our future and critical for young people to get to jobs, to get to school, and so on, but then looking also at from indigenous people, I think is really, really um, important and an important step. Um, so yeah, I, again, I welcome everyone. I welcome everyone to, to make to have this discussion. I'm really looking forward. I know that we have an outcome statement that we're going to be, uh, we really hope people will give input to. We're trying to be as collective and as, um, as participatory as possible, especially with, the, again, the ability of people from all over the world to be able to connect. So thank you very much, and I'll pass it back to Landry. Thank you very much, Doug, for the introduction. Uh, and that brings us to, uh, to the meat of the session, uh, where we're going to give uh, our really diverse and I think very fascinating set of speakers uh, the floor to share their perspectives uh, with, with all of you. Uh, on that note, there will be a, a joint Q&A with, with all uh, attendees at the end of the session uh, after the six speakers have shared their perspectives and we had an individual Q&A with all of them. Um, to that end, can I ask everybody to pop their questions in the chat so we can select them uh, at the end of the session and pose them and pass them on to the, to the various speakers. Um, of course, we, we're live on Facebook through the Youth uh, uh, channel as well. Um, those people unfortunately won't be uh, posing any questions today or able to pose any questions today. I'm sure those who are joining us on Zoom um, please I invite you uh, to, to share any questions that may come up or that you may have for our speakers. Um, and that brings us to our first. Uh, to our Lander, first. perhaps we should do just a quick photo while everyone is here. Well, all, all our opening speakers and, you know, the first few panelists. Yeah, let's do the Ikosaki Forum tradition of taking a webinar photo at the beginning. Also, since Asian Youth Council is um, one of the co-hosts, it's the Asian way to always take photos of um, webinars and events. I am sure the Asians will understand. <laughs> it's 
So let's do that. And also just remind everyone to um, uh, remember our hashtags, um, Indigenous Youth, hashtag Move Her, hashtag um, Youth 2030, which is the, the, the trending hashtag right now for Ecosoc Youth Forum. All right, we're on the first view. And then I'm gonna go on the second. Okay, we're good. Thank you, Lander. Thank you, Regine. Thank you for that. Um, and uh, our, our first speaker of the day is uh, Shia Bastida. Um, she, you're not only, of course, one of the uh, leading organizers of Fridays for Futures uh, in New York City. Um, you're also a member of the uh, indigenous, uh, Mexican indigenous uh, autonomy contact nation. Um, and thank you for joining us today as, as a leading voice, of course, uh, for, for young uh, indigenous people and climate activism, uh, particularly, which of course is very relevant to today's topic. Um, so please, the floor is uh, the floor is yours before our Q and A, uh, and, and uh, please, can I invite you to deliver your address. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, so hi everyone, it's such an honor to be here sharing the floor with all of you, and hello to. Uh, our participants to join us from all over the world. My name is Gia Bastida and I'm a climate justice activist organizer with Fridays for Future and the co-founder of Re-Earth Initiative. And today I wanted to talk to you about something really important, which is how I see cities uh, from the perspective of youth and indigenous peoples. So the first time that I ever uh, heard the concept of Inclusive Cities was at the World Urban Forum in 2017. Oh, sorry about that. Okay, so it was at the World Urban Forum in 2017 that happened in Malaysia that actually UN Habitat uh, invited me to. And in this um, conference, I heard about the concept of inclusive cities, resilient cities, cities that work for people. And that was the first time that I realized that Things didn't have to be like in Mexico City, for example, where there are so many cars that you can't even enjoy the city as a pedestrian. And you, you know, there, there are so many cars that even our license plates uh, are restricted on certain days to restrict air pollution. Um, we are at a point where almost 70, more than 71% of indigenous peoples actually live in cities. And Right now, our cities are extremely segregated. They are, um, you know, extremely polluted, and this is not something that we can uh, sustain. So that is where I think that indigenous philosophy can come in the development of cities, because indigenous uh, philosophy is about reciprocity, is about having a relationship with Mother Earth, and that is what our cities should be like. They should be built for people. They should be built for us, not for cars not for industries. And so um, one of the stories that I have to share with you is that uh, about the importance of indigenous uh, you know, input when building cities is that you know, in my hometown, there was this university that was gonna be built uh, and the indigenous people of that town said, you, you can't build it here because we are on a wetland. And then the people uh, who are building the university said, we have experts and we actually think it's fine. So the university was built and right now it sits on in, you know, just on in the middle of, of nowhere, basically sunk, half sunk. And that's what the indigenous people of, of that uh, neighboring town said. And that just shows that, you know, land is different all over the world. And the only people who know exactly how the land behaves are the indigenous people of, of the land, of that specific area. So we cannot just generalize our, our, you know, our information from one city to the other. We have to work proactively with the communities who are present there. Um, and the last thing that I will share with you today are three articles from the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People that highlight how important it is to uh, think intersectionally when it comes to building cities. The first one is Article 18, which says Indigenous people have the right to participate in decision making in matters which affect their rights through representatives chosen by themselves. And, you know, the first point is if you want inclusive cities, you need inclusive leadership. 
And that's why it's so important to have not only indigenous representatives at decision-making platforms that are to build cities, but also youth, um, which, sorry, my phone went on. My mom is calling me <laughs> this morning. Um, which brings me to article 14, which says indigenous peoples, uh, particularly children have the right to all levels and forms of education. And as mentioned before, one of the primary things uh, for children to have access to education is have access to transportation. And if our cities are not built for that, if they're not built for children to have access to all of these things, it's gonna become a barrier as they grow up and as you know, parents try to get their children to school. And the last article is article eight, which says indigenous peoples and individuals have the right to not be subject and forced to assimilation or destruction of their culture, which I think is the most important thing because as we see the number of indigenous peoples in cities growing, we cannot um, have systems that want, uh, you know, that want indigenous people to assimilate to whatever the culture of the city is because indigenous peoples have their own culture and, you know, our own way of looking at the world. And we want to share that with you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Shia, for that, uh, that really powerful opening actually, and, and a very, very strong and, and, uh, and uh, uh, impressive message that you shared with us uh, this morning. Um, if I may follow up with, with just a few questions uh, on, on that, on that second directly, you, you talk a lot about the involvement of indigenous groups um, in, in urban planning, you give practical examples of that in, in, in having the voice heard. How do you recommend practically cities, societies go about that? What, what sort of, how can, how can that practically be organized? Do you think? Well, um, you know, one of the um, most recurring questions that I get as an organizer in New York City by other groups is, can you contact me to indigenous leaders? And it's almost like they're not, you know, it's not like people are not there. I think that the issue is that there's not uh, systems in place to actually include people who need to be part of the conversation. Um, and what ends up happening is that the same people end up being represented at basically all the same level, all the uh, tables of decision-making because there is not an outreach process that is efficient enough. So I think that if we wanna get to the point where you know, there's a proportionate number of indigenous representatives at various decision making tables. There needs to be a system for that. There needs to be a recruitment system, a system that feels inviting and a system that feels inclusive. Fantastic, thanks for that. And maybe a last question, uh, if I may, before, before we move on. Um, of course, you're, you're very well planned, uh, So it's, uh, would be very to, uh, interesting. Not to mute, thank you. Um, uh, and uh, of course, you know, you, you, you're a very well-known climate activist, uh, as I said. Um, how do you see that intersectionality? How do you see those, those uh, issues of inclusivity, uh, issues of indigenous groups and issues of climate uh, change and activism come together? Um, how do you see that, that collectively? Um, so, you know, as we all know here, and I'm sure all of the participants know, the climate crisis is the biggest crisis that we've ever faced um, as humanity. And unfortunately, the climate crisis is affecting frontline communities the most, including indigenous communities and communities of color. So when we think about the fact that the climate crisis affects every single sector, we need to think about how every single sector can be part of the solution. So that's how I know that uh, transportation and the development of cities and how youth are educated all ultimately come together to what is our collective goal of addressing the climate crisis in a holistic way that is about justice, that is about not only parts of million of carbon in the atmosphere, but it's actually about people's livelihoods and quality of life and dignity. Brilliant, thank you for that, Chi. And I think on that, uh, on that note, uh, and with that advice, we can uh, move on and I'll hand over to Regine, uh, our, our co-organizer, who first of course introduce herself uh, and then our next speaker. Regine, over to you. Thank you, Lander and Sia. Thank you so much for that interesting opening to our panel. Um, I'm really like somebody representing for the past five years, the Asian Youth Council Committee for Asian Youth Cooperation. I always um, tend to look at things in a regional lens. So it's always um, 
very useful also and and, and um like it makes it makes her it makes her understanding deeper whenever we hear from young people from other regions so i very much appreciate interregional conversations and that said i am happy to introduce the next speaker which is from who is from my region he she is a really inspiring very very young speaker from india Lucipriya Kamujam, Indian climate change activist and is the recipient of the World Children Peace Prize for her clean air initiatives. Lucipriya, the floor is yours. Yes. Um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. My name is Lucipriya Kamujam. I am nine years old. I'm an Indian climate activist and the founder of the Child Movement. Thanks to United Nation for inviting me in this forum. I was born in Manipur, which is a small, beautiful northeastern state of India, um, border in Myanmar, um, border with Myanmar. My birthplace is surrounded by lush green mountains and alluring atmosphere. Um, a frequent floods in our village and surrounding areas forced our family to migrate to Delhi. Um, 2016 was the first time where I came to Delhi. Um, and it turns me and I couldn't be and um, I couldn't and there was lots of evolution in that time and um, I can't breathe the a clean air in that in there, and also I have to move to Bhubanish for Odisha for my for my schooling. And again, my home in Odisha was hit by cyclone Titli in 2018 and cyclone Fani in 2019. All such incidents in my young life turns me into a child climate activist. Um, you see, why should I speak here? Why should I worry about the climate change? Why should I talk to the people about the various environmental issues happening around the world? I have to read my books, I have to play with my friends, I have to study, I have to enjoy my beautiful childhood life. Um, climate, but our leaders ruined all our beautiful childhood life. Um, climate change is not only for me or for you or for someone else. Climate change problem is for every single person living in this world. Each and every child living in this country, living in this world, are already the victims of climate change. That's why I'm fighting to save our planet and our future. Um, my country has many environmental issues like floods, droughts, heat waves, cyclone, locusts, air pollution, etc. But these are all the impact of climate change. I think you all heard the news about Australia bushfire, California wildfire, Amazon rainforest fire, and Siberia forest fire. Billions of animals has died, millions of trees has gone, and really very sad. I couldn't sleep, I couldn't even take my food. Many children lost their homes, but this is the real effect of climate change. Why our leaders don't have the time to hear our voice, but this is the real climate emergency. They must act now to save our planet and our future. But you might not um, yet he hear about the recent Simlipal forest fire, Uttarakhand Himalayan ice burst, Bandragav National Park wildfire, etc. Because global media tell very little about the climate, environmental, and eco ecological crisis in of India and the global south. The world um, never count our crisis as a crisis. Simli Pal Forest is the Asia's second largest biosphere um, reserve and even in the list of UNESCO site. If it happens in um, Europe, America, Japan, or Australia, it will be a big global news. Media needs to, um, me needs to see equally the environmental issues of the global south if we really want to solve the um, global climate crisis. The air quality um, in Delhi, the city where I'm currently living, is the worst in the world. Air pollution in India kills about 2 million people every year. 
It is the fifth largest killer in India. In Delhi, poor quality air damages the lungs of 2.2 million or 50% of the children. Children are more vulnerable to air pollution as we are growing and developing. We breathe a higher rate of air per kilogram of our wet body weight. Um, we also spend more time outside and are thus more exposed to it. Sacrificing and the lives of the millions of innocent children for the failures of our leaders is unacceptable um, at any cost. Instead of finding a long-term solution, our leaders um, should take immediate climate action to save our planet and our future. And I have a dream where there are more electric and solar vehicles on roads instead of more fossil fuel vehicles. I have a dream where there is shutdown um, of every coil and thermal power plants and replace it by clean renewable energy. Um, I have a dream where there is more bicycle on roads instead of more motor vehicles. Riding a bicycle means there will be zero traffic problems, zero carbon emission, and zero noise pollution. And it will save our valuable, our valuable green spaces from developing. Um, today, I have a small message to all the children of the world. Children must tell their parents that they should walk if it's nearby or they can use the bicycle. Um, and they should tell to their parents that you can, they can use the public transport if it's um, far distance. And um, please don't use garbage, um, plastic, um, add the single use plastic at your home and don't, don't throw garbage or plastic on street, ocean, river seas or any other places. Um, and, and today I would like to tell something to our leaders. You don't know how to fix the ice melting in the Arctic, Antarctica and the Himalayas. You don't know how to fix the sea level rising and submerging our beautiful islands. You don't know how to fix the locusts destroying our crops. You don't know how to fix the air pollution affecting our health and killing 6 million children every year. You don't know how to fix the locusts destroying our crops. You don't know how to fix the heat waves killing poor people every year. You don't know how to fix the hole in our ozone layer. You don't know how to fix the wildfire um, killing millions of animals and millions of trees every year. You don't know how to fix the COVID-19 virus killing the humanity every day. You don't know how to fix the habitats of countless and watchless animals now used for mining. You don't know how to fix the rivers and lakes now dry and dead. You don't know how to fix the forest now transform into desert. If you don't know how to fix it, please stop breaking it. I'm not telling here the list of problems happening around the world, but these are all the facts where we can't deny it. The best gift parents can give to their children is not a beautiful house, expensive cars, lots of money. The best gift you can give to your children is a beautiful planet. To give this planet, you have to change yourself. If you can change yourself, then you can change your family. If you can change your family, then you can change your neighborhood. If you can change your neighborhood, then you can change your community. If you can change your community, then you can change your state. If you can change your state, then you can change your fam um, your country. If you can change your country, then you can change the whole world. Change means empowerment. Empowerment means independent. Independent means freedom. Freedom is when you can protect your land and environment. Freedom is when you can protect your children's future, culture, and health. Freedom is when no no one can discriminate you on the basis of caste, creed, color, sex, or any other differences. Freedom is when you can read and write. Um, freedom is when you are out of hunger. Freedom is when we are all together in this fight. Fight for your freedom. Thank you. Jehan Sanaleba Manipurna Yafe. Thank you once again. Thank you so much, Lucy Priya. You're such a breath of fresh air, really. I'm, I'm always inspired whenever I hear you. It's really motivating that you started at a very young age, and I hope that you don't lose 
um, your confidence in us youth leaders and also in, of course, in, in our mentors in the older generation. You're right that um, the children and also the youth are, are the future, but also we're the present. And, and I think that your speech is a good reminder that we have to be mindful of our everyday actions that affect not only us, but also the future generation and um, the planet that we share. So this is very much, of course, not just an interregional, but also an intergenerational conversation. Thank you for joining us and please keep on um, inspiring and keep on engaging different um, allies across the world. Thank you, ma'am. Lander? Thank you, ma'am. Was, uh, that was very inspiring. Uh, and on that note, uh, we move on to our, to our third uh, speaker. And now we move on from uh, youth activism to, to young experts um, with, uh, with uh, Shreve Bazu. Thank you for joining us uh, this, this afternoon. Um, you're the communication and technology lead uh, of Safety Pin, um, which is an online tech platform uh, aiming to use data mapping uh, uh, to, to, to overcome uh, and, and to make cities safe for women in terms of walkability. Uh, in particular. Uh, thank you very much for joining us uh, and, uh, and the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Lander. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Shreya. I think it's been so nice to hear the previous speakers talk about um, you know, climate change. And though Safety Pin doesn't look at that, we do look at inclusive mobility and inclusive cities. So I do think that it ties up together well. Um, you know, let me just give an introduction. Safety Pen is a set of apps and a technology platform that uses data to make public spaces and public transport safer and more inclusive for women. So we do look at the youth, we look at women, and we look at, um, you know, intersectional groups as well as excluded groups of people in cities. We collect data based on parameters that we think uh, identify and measure how safe a public space is. So we look at things like lighting in a place, how accessible it is, how walkable it is. So that also looks at, you know, do you have enough infrastructure for walking and cycling, not just, you know, for cars and traffic management. We look at what kind of security is there. And then we also look at the social usage of a space, which is um, how many people use it and what kind of gender diversity does a place have. So to collect this data, we have a crowdsourced app, which is called My Safety Pin. Um, where anybody can download it for free and they can put in their inputs and through a safety audit and basically rate the parameters that I've mentioned. And that's it. I mean, it's as simple as that. It takes about a minute, but we can use this data and we take it to city governments and local authorities to then make, you know, to give them recommendations for actionable change that they can make. So currently on this app, we have over 100,000 users. We have users in 154 countries who are giving us data. And we have over, I think, 400,000 audits that have already been done. So you know, we, we use it in different cities. And we have worked with over 45 cities globally. So we've worked in South Africa. We worked in Latin America. And um, I'm present in Delhi, in Gurgaon. So we have worked extensively in India. Um, and the, we have another way of collecting data as well, which is a large scale data collection. So through this method, we collect citywide images. And then we have our team backend who analyzes it along with a little help from machine learning. We haven't automated our system completely yet, but we're in the process. And then, you know, we have more concrete data to give to the government. So I think I would like to share one of the examples and then, you know, tell you more about what we can do with our data. I think one thing is that in Delhi, we had actually given our data to the government in 2016 and told them that there were 7,000 dark spots where there was no lighting. So, you know, women felt especially unsafe and they took that data in and, you know, made changes. And when we did a remapping of the city in 2019, we found that those spots had reduced by 5,000. So they had taken change and it was one step, um, you know, closer to making the city safer. We also look at public transport a lot. So we have done mobility-based research with um, in India and abroad with uh, the Asia Foundation, with FIA Foundation, where we have spoken to women and done qualitative as well as quantitative analysis. And we found that uh, you know, some of the biggest problems women face with public transport is 
how crowded is it or you know if it's too empty how is the bus stop maintained and there are a lot of factors that play into it but i think one important thing is that public transport is i mean the unsafety of public transport is not just about being in it it's also about the entire journey and how it limits a person's economic and social opportunity you know they don't there are many women who take jobs closer to home because they fear um longer distances they fear the journey so we look at a very different i mean many different types of ways in which safety is perceived we look at you know this is one of them we also look at accessibility a lot and i mean i could go on <laughs> endlessly if i had the time but i would love to open the floor up and to you to any questions that there may be and in the chat box i will put the link uh, for the app so if you have time you know people can check it out Thank yeah. you very much. Thank you very much, Lashra. That was very, very, uh, very inspiring and very interesting as an initiative, uh, indeed. Uh, maybe can you can you talk us through some of the the, the direct effects that you see, let's say, you know, so maybe some of the feedback that you get from, from people using the platform. So, sort of what reactions do you get? How do you see that it makes a difference in people's lives? Absolutely. I think that's also a great question because you know, if you have a large user base, how are they actually reacting to what you're putting out? And we've actually done a lot of projects in uh, semi-urban and rural areas as well, where we do um, try to bridge the digital divide, though we can't completely do that. Um, you know, so we do work with people, and we go back. So we go back after we've done one round of data collection, after some change has been made, or we've spoken to some authorities. And once we come back with some information, we then share that with the people who've done the audits to show them the impact of what they're putting in. And that's why we have users who will repeatedly um, do the safety audit or put the information on the app because they are able to see actionable change based on what they're putting in. Um, and I think that's how we see it. And also, I mean, we stay connected. I think the world is very digital now. Social media is very active. You can very easily keep in touch with anybody, you know, across the world with just one username because we do protect our users' identity. So only if they reach out to us can we follow up. We don't save any of their details or track their location. Uh, you know, so we, we try to maintain that. So I think that's how we follow up with our users as well. That's great. Thanks for that. And maybe maybe a final question uh, from my yes. end. We'll mm -hmm. move on to the next speaker. Uh, of course, we live in very challenging times also for mobility and, and public transport and the use of public space. Um, uh, is there any feedback from the users on, on COVID and how the, how the experience uh, changed, let's say, over the last year in public spaces and, and, and using mobility? Absolutely. I think, um, again, a very interesting question. And what we've seen in COVID is, like I said, we measure physical infrastructure and the social usage of a space. So the physical infrastructure won't change based on COVID, but what does change is how people are using that space. People are not using it for leisure as much. They're not going out just to you know, hang around or be a, like out and about. And so what we do is based on the data we have, we create a safety score for different spaces. And we've seen that the safety score of places does has reduced in the last year because people aren't using it, because the concept of eyes on the street, gender diversity, pedestrians, automatically reduces when public spaces are unsafe for people to be out. And I think that's one big change that we've seen, but um, I don't think that stops us from working to make it more accessible or walkable so that when people can come out fully, the city is you know, a better place for them. Thank you. Fantastic, thank you very much, Rhea. And I'm passing on back to Regine uh, for our next panelist. Thank you. Thank you, Lander, and thank you, Shreya. I think it's quite an interesting, um, also not very abrupt shift from our youth speakers to our young experts. It's an um, there was an interesting um, like shared points and then as well as progression in, in, in those two panels. Um, I hope that we can zero in as we, as we close with our last two or three spe speakers more on the gender lens too, because our last three speakers are women speakers. So we've had indigenous speaker, indigenous youth speakers, and we, we tried to have some gender balance as well in our panel. So that said, I'm happy to introduce the next speaker, Julia Marzetti from Belgium. She is one of the driving personalities behind European Footprints, a European project raising awareness of environmental issues and SDGs while engaging communities and connecting them with local sustainability initiatives. And I think she is um, also professionally working in, in the transport sector herself. 
Julia, over to you. Thank you, Regine, and thank you everyone for having me here. Um, indeed, today I'll be talking about uh, my experience as an engineer working in the in transport and transport transition, and he was working in different cities around the world and how we can actually design cities so that they are, um, yes, they contribute as a lighthouse to achieve the sustainable development goals, but actually they are livable and usable for everyone and especially the most vulnerable. So women, but also children and, um, and indigenous, but also uh, elderly people as well. So what, we have, what I've seen working all over, um, mainly high, high income countries, is that usually when it comes to transportation and design of urban, uh, urban um, mobility, et cetera, um, the, the user aspect is taken into account quite late in the design stage. So usually we do see a tokenization of the user case scenarios. So most of the design decisions and the high level decision are actually already taken by the time that the design is presented to selected um, number of use um, use case uh, people or actually um, use the or give feedback to the scenario and um, and this is indeed uh, not uh, what we would like to have to uh, to design our city in a uh, in a very inclusive way simply because for example as Sharia has already as already mentioned much of our city uh, are dark have very narrow streets which are not suitable for a, a young mom who has a stroller, for example, or pregnant women, and, uh, and even less our transportation system are suitable for people with, uh, um, with um, reduced mobility, um, people who have any disability, we may have a wheelchair, for example, and uh, so they're not accessible, either safe. And a possible way to, um, to overcome this is A, indeed, with participatory design, um, be indeed with the, the tool, the sh some tools as a, a feedback, as Sharif has mentioned. And, uh, and also something I'm very passionate about is actually increasing the diversity and inclusion of our for for workforce because I've often um, be the only female in the room when uh, talking, when, when actually working on these engineering projects. And uh, it's actually very difficult if we have always used to design uh, things and we only have the same people in the room right and but I do strongly believe that as we have more female in the workforce and especially in those uh, in those male dominated uh, male dominated industries that can be engineered that can be also um, urbanization at some point but also in decision making um, uh, places. So we have more female engineers, we have more young people, as we have uh, more people from different backgrounds, from indigenous background, etc. Um, this uh, design will actually become more inclusive and will, from the start, uh, with a system thinking perspective, actually think about a holistic approach on how we can design cities so that they are safe that they have the right space for women, uh, children um, to, uh, to live and to have walkable cities so that everyone can feel safe and can also feel as they are participating in the cities and participating in the decision making of the city. Thank you, Julia. Can you stay with us for another minute or two? Yeah, for sure. Thank you. My pleasure. Um, do you have some feedback based on the experiences of the previous speakers from other regions? I know that you shared more about um, your experience in, in, with your project in Europe, but with regards to, say, um, maybe s stronger um, or like deeper challenges of of gender and ethnic minorities in especially in in the global south how do you how what what can you what best practices can you share in that regard indeed i think this is partially linked to um to how gender equality is advancing at different pace, paces around different uh, um different uh, geographies but uh, Having said that, I mean, I don't think that high income country or uh, 
actually have achieved uh, gender equality by all means. And I do think that some of the challenges that are there, so specifically how we make our workforce diverse and how we make sure that our user cases do encompass um, accessibility uh, rights and, uh, and uh, rights of, uh, of you know, women and children are actually um, relevant for all over geographies. And also it uh, depends on the, hist I think it depends on the history of the country specifically. So how much of, um, you know, how, how much females have been in, um, in leading position in specific countries. And uh, of course, some countries have seen this uh, decision-making uh, processes and this access to decision-making position by female and by different minorities earlier than other countries. But still, I think uh, some practices are, are scalable uh, everywhere. So for example, promoting um, uh, yeah, more female in, in, in the workforce, more female in, uh, in urban um, in, in urban mobility, more female in, in engineer, of course, in science and technology, also promoting access to education because before getting female to your decision making position, they need to have the right to have that education. And, and that is very, very important. Um, uh, uh, and indeed in some countries uh, than other. Thank you so much, Julia. That, those are excellent points. I'd like to call back my colleague, Lander, for the next speaker. Yeah, thank you, Regine. Thank you very much for that. Uh, uh, we go from the experts back to, uh, to the activism, uh, if, if we may, with, uh, with Lee and Amogawa. Before we uh, come to you, Lee, I may invite uh, people on the call to post their questions and to pop their questions into Q&A at the bottom already. There is some questions coming in on the chat, but there is a specifically uh, a Q&A function where you can ask any questions that you may have, uh, either open ones to the group or to specific uh, speakers. So feel free to, uh, to, to push your questions in there and we'll come to that uh, after, after the speakers. So uh, we'll make sure that there is plenty of time at the end to address your questions. Um, now then, Leah, uh, over to you, if we go from Belgium to, to Uganda. Uh, Leah, you're, you're a leading uh, youth climate activist from Uganda, uh, leading Fridays for Futures uh, in your home country. Uh, and of course, you're very well known for uh, the leading, uh, leading tree planting campaigns and starting a uh, petition to enforce the plastic bag ban uh, in Uganda, uh, among others. So uh, very grateful to have you here with all your expertise and with, with your valuable insights. Um, so the floor is yours. Uh, hello, everyone. As a girl from the Global South, allow me to share what I commonly observe and what I think should be done. Here we mainly use public transport, that is for both men and women. Busy and rush hours, public transport is called for the strong one gets in front. Mm -hmm. And when you observe, women are always accompanied with children and luggage, more often in public transport. This, this leaves women late for work because of our weak bodies. When married females get convict because they are unable to access transport in time, some husbands do not understand. This leads to instability, conflict, and separation in homes, only because there is no proper design transport systems for females. It is very important when we are di dis discussing mobility limitation that we emphasize is uh, the emphasis is put on women's low economic opportunities. That is to say the unfair distribution of jobs, thinking that female can't manage, for example, um, categorizing household duties. It is also equally important to put into consideration when planning for female mobility, where the young girls, mostly indigenous youth, can benefit from the opportunities offered. I'm saying this because indigenous youth at some point are dealt with as failures, criminals, because of their culture taking and their culture first. That, that is, there is need for the government to implement policies that are safe for youth with cultural connections. I'm of my view that the youth of today have increased in wisdom and they're doing amazing things in all sectors of the world. We have always been a wake up call in different things. Therefore, in all policy making bodies, I think we need a platform. And don't forget that maturity is not age. 
is the ability to handle responsibility. Thank you so much. Thank you, Leanne. Thank you for, for raising some very, uh, very interesting points there, and particularly at the end on, on maturity. Um, uh, how do you, picking up on that, how do you uh, see that in practice, for instance, in your own country, in Uganda, how does that engagement work um, uh, uh, if, if you look at it in a, in a practical sense? Come again. How does it work? So, so you talk about you talk about the engagement of, of, of children. You talk about the engagement of different groups uh, in in in, this, in these processes of inclusion, whether that's urban planning at large, whether that's uh, climate activism, whether that's mobility in specific. Um, so, how how does that engagement work in practice? How can uh, cities, for instance, go about uh, including the voice of young people uh, to to become truly inclusive for everyone of, of every age and of every gender? Um, as I said, we should have to, we have to first give platform for the young people because they, they have, they, they have very many innovative solutions because we have to have a say in our future and to create more public transport, specifically for the females, so that we don't have to fight for transport or have to walk very long distances because we can't get access to public transport. Fantastic. Thank you, thank you very much for your insights, Ali, and thank you for joining us today. I'm going to pass over to uh, Regine again uh, to move us to the uh, last uh, youth activist of the day before we come to the government representative. So Regine, over to you, and thanks again, Leah. It's a pleasure. Yes, thank you so much, Lander and Leah. I'm happy to introduce our last speaker who is representing the Global Indigenous Youth Caucus. I think he'll be able to somehow try to wrap up our youth discussions as he is also sitting in the major group for children and youth, which is the mandate space for young people and children by the General Assembly. He is also with the SARC Youth Platform, so he engages a lot on um, interregional discourse as well, especially in South Asia. And he is the convener of the Young for Environment, Education and Development Foundation, YFEED, which is based in Nepal. Anish? Uh, yes, um, thank you very much, uh, Rizin, uh, for the floor, and really uh, uh, glad to be in this um, uh, in this platform today with all of you, so much inspiring words and uh, you know motivational thoughts on shared on the public transportation and inclusive, making it more inclusive, which is the most important thing at the moment. So we talk about everything to you know these days, you know every uh, thematic and also other engagements uh, and also the participation of young people, but uh, mostly it's uh, like uh, overall and not reflecting the diversity and inclusiveness or you know doesn't have a clear picture uh, of how we will cover up and will respect the intersectionalities diversities and uh, the um, representation uh, the sectoral representation we have uh, within ourselves so I think uh, this is the most important moment that we discuss on this and uh, make the way for the engagement of the those sectors, those uh, youth who are the farthest left behind in the mainstream process. And that's more important when we talk about the mobility or the urban management, urban mobility and the transportation. I think uh, this COVID-19 uh, global pandemic has brought a lot of uh, changes in our di daily life. You know, a lot of uh, things have turned down and a lot of things have changed. A lot of things has, you know, gone um, another way, you know, what, you know, we, uh, we weren't expected, expecting beforehand, I think. And also the transportation is for the same. Uh, it doesn't, you know, looks different so it has been going uh, through lots of ups and down beforehand and also you know after the pandemic it has gone worse you know uh, people are challenging um, uh, people uh, life has been challenging in terms of the mobility and uh, they are facing uh, multiple challenges and multiple problems uh, to commute in their daily life and uh, that that goes more to the uh, vulnerable po population such as the uh, indigenous people and indigenous youth uh, who are uh, themselves have a challenge in adapting to the urban environment and uh, 
to uh, various urban lifestyle in the uh, their you know um, life and uh, with this uh, pandemic it has make it uh, very difficult so uh, you know uh, there's no like proper guidance and proper uh, structural um, um, things put in place in uh, especially in the developing countries or the least developed countries uh, for the public transportation and uh, this vulnerable population has been you know facing a lot of problems and now with the pandemic it's going to uh, get um, more problematic and uh, i think we need to make the way how, how we can adapt to the public health uh, regulations and then uh, the uh, public transportation and also in uh, respecting the intersectionalities and the uh, barriers uh, the indigenous youth or indigenous population face in participating and communicating in their daily life a lot of uh, young um, the governments has not, not able to address and will see uh, the diversity and how you know uh, what is the different with the mainstream population with the um, uh, vulnerable population in commuting. I think the plans, the programs, and the policies, and uh, the technology itself should be designed in a way uh, that reflect those diversity that address uh, their concerns uh, because uh, they don't know where to board on and how to board on and you know what to use on so that they can be safe and they can uh, you know make themselves um, others safer during the pandemic while traveling so i think these are the important key factors we need to see and we need to uh, include and uh, and for the inclusiveness and for the diversity on the public transportation, suppose like uh, giving some uh, stories or the experience uh, from the ground, like in you know, Nepal in the, in the previous lockdown, this, it was like for a long time, the public transportation has been bad and even there was uh, no a proper system put in place for the emergency uh, travel during that that time using uh, you know ambulance you know uh, using um, things and a lot of uh, like uh, drivers lot of a uh, lot of the passengers of the tra transportation doesn't have uh, the uh, guidelines or doesn't have the proper way to use them when they in, uh, in need so like uh, people and also it's make uh, making more complex with the people's limited knowledge on the pandemic itself like you know there's a lot of uh, people having uh, several health difficulties and they need to uh, go to for emergency treatment and you know some uh, people uh, do not uh, able to um, uh, you know uh, diversified or do not able to uh, cut it down with the COVID-19. So, you know, everything was like being like um, publicized that uh, the uh, problems or the health, uh, you know, situation that moment was all the COVID-19 pandemic. So sometimes, you know, even drivers, sometimes passengers uh, refuse to travel with others. I think these are kind of like limited knowledge and limited uh, a kind of uh, information and sometimes misinformation was uh, guiding and was misleading people uh, with getting the proper access to the public transportation and also uh, to participate in uh, it for the life saving and for uh, for emergency purposes too. So I think uh, you can understand how you know uh, it might be worse on on that and also you know it might be more difficult in uh, the normal environment so you know both normal environment and then uh, the emergency was like of all kind of trouble uh, during uh, those especially in the lockdown times last year and i think some kind of things are, are, are also the same so i think we need to build more awareness of the our population on also not only on the how we develop or use the technology also the uh, misinformation myths associated with the uh, pandemic and uh, you know how to we treat the vulnerable population uh, during those times and also in the normal times to uh, for interrogating them and the, them to have the opportunity to uh, participate and to uh, run their daily lives i think these are kind of things that we need to take on and also the, i think uh, i will call on the governments to see uh, that the protection for the vulnerable population is the most uh, while we designing and planning everything and especially on uh, their securing their rights to a uh, free uh, and uh, movement and uh, participate uh, and uh, 
Uh, also, uh, access to public transportation and urban mobility. Uh, so we need to see that and we need to also make uh, able to young peoples, especially indigenous young peoples and the marginalized youth uh, to participate in decision making you know, what uh, are, are in the needs of our communities, where we stand and what kind of technology or what kind of solution can benefit us and help us uh, help uh, the governments, states and the stakeholders to shape and to mobilize it, it for the sake of the community and for the, also the uh, our knowledge to our experience to contribute to the wider uh, population um, uh, designing the program and then uh, the mobility itself. Uh, so I rest here. Anish, uh, and uh, thank you very much. For may your, I ask uh, you a quick question? We have about a minute left, so let's keep it very brief. Um, so in summary, what do you think can we ask from stakeholders as young activists? So we're back in the activist track. Um, of course, there's that level of participation where, for instance, Julia spoke about women leadership. So there's providing opportunities for young people. And at the same time, there's that aspect of protection, which our earlier speakers spoke of around, you know, human rights, indigenous rights. So how do we make public transport or even just our city safer for women, youth, and indigenous people before we even empower them to be leaders in this field, right? So in one minute, what do you think can we ask for from our stakeholders, government and the UN? I think government, UN, and everyone associated or concerned with this uh, topic and uh, with uh, the um, issue uh, that uh, we all, I think, uh, is a common for us, just uh, the intensity and the type or the, you know, uh, the level of uh, knowledge and participant might be different. So I think uh, first we need uh, the stakeholders recognition of the uh, vulnerable population, also indigenous peoples or the classes and uh, then a population uh, that we need support. And then uh, we need to bring them to the table to understand their issues, to understand their uh, environment, to understand their um, um, problems or to, to understand their you know, aspiration or you know, whatever their aim. So I think uh, this uh, this is the first we need to get them on board. So often, uh, you know, we are speaking uh, with the peoples. We are, you know, um, work, uh, communicating on their behalf, not but, but not uh, without, you know, participating them. So I I believe in nothing about us without us. So uh, first, if you are want to taking uh, the someone issue, someone uh, problem, someone you know, uh, decision on someone's life. So you need to participate that that uh, our population that that people uh, to the uh, uh, to that uh, platform so i think uh, first we need to connect them to the platform uh, and the stakeholder need to recognize them and then with consulting with them pre prior and informed consent we can go uh, with them on the to know what they aspire and what we need and what we best de can design on the urban mobility or the uh, whatever you know urban solution or urban environment that we need to build upon uh, recognize and uh, to help them uh, to uh, sustain and they can uh, leave the similar and uh, enjoy the similar um, privileges and rights as of with other uh, population and uh, for that I think young population need to be trained, uh, build capacity and participate it meaningfully uh, and to save uh, the future for all of us uh, for a better planet and better mobility. Thank you. Thank you so much Anish. Nothing with nothing about us without us. Indeed. You should be the battle cry of the ECOSOC Youth Forum. Okay, we will have more time for a question and answer between our attendees and our panelists and maybe even between our panelists. But without further ado, I'd like to give the floor to our hosting member state. We're very grateful to the permanent mission of the Philippines to the UN for co-hosting this event. And we are graced by the Assistant Secretary of the Department of Transportation of the Philippines. Um, the Philippines, and in fact, our wider region is quite an interesting um, demographic in this topic because we are the most diverse region in the world and our own country is very diverse. We have 7,100 plus, not even 100 anymore, I think 7,400 something islands with 100 languages, not, and we haven't even counted the dialects yet. So we're very diverse and we have yet to... Um, progress in some gender targets and of course, you know, catering to our, our different minorities, but 
um, we are very grateful for the advances that we've made in the urban sphere, especially in the transport industry. So without further ado, this is um, Dr. Assistant Secretary Sheila Napalang. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Mabuhay from the Philippines. I am so pleased to be with young people. It makes me feel young. So allow me please to share with you our um, my professional as well as my personal experience in the intersectionality, well, in, in addressing gender in public transportation. So allow me please to share my presentation. All right. So. I'd like to discuss with you gender equity considerations in transportation system development and operations from the Philippine context. You know, those of you who work in the field of gender and um, gender and development, you are all aware that women and men, and that, that's a fact, women and men have different travel uh, needs. Like women, according to literature, have more chained trips because of the variety of their uh, roles, right? And so they're caregiver, they are also teachers. So sometimes they're asked, after work, they're asked to go grocery shopping. Now, what you have there is already a, encapsulates how women, uh, the challenges of women in taking public transportation. You know, what are the challenges? One of which is, uh, the one on the left, uh, well, on the left is uh, the traditional jeepneys, and in the traditional jeepneys, the step boards are high. So based on our discussion with women, we do a lot of focus group discussions um, professionally and in my line of work as well. One of the problems is the physical access due to high step board. Now think about it. If you're a woman with children or if you're a woman with a lot of luggages, that there is already a challenge, right? The second challenge that was also found out both in the surveys that we conducted and even in the focus group discussions in the development of our public transportation systems, women reported that they are exposed, there's a high exposure to physical harassment in overloaded uh, public transportation. You know, the, the lack of space makes it easier for physical harassment to happen, right? Uh, earlier on, there was also a discussion that one of our gender issues as far as transport is concerned is the lack of inadequate, the lack or inadequate sidewalks like a lot of women bring their kids to school, children to school, and they would have to use sidewalks. So that becomes a gender issue when your sidewalks are not fully paved and there are potholes and even uh, manholes that people can fall through. Another bias that we saw, <laughs> and this is true, I, I drive, I, I learned how to drive when I was 48 years old. I'm only 15. Now I learned how to drive when I was 48 years old because I needed to bring my son uh, you know, for, 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 for his activities, that's how. But one of the things I noticed, and this is both from a professional, because literature can attest to this, and even from the per personal level, is there's a bias against women. You know, when, when, when people see that there's a, like there's a congestion ahead, and if they see it's a woman driving, the normal, uh, the normal reaction is, ah, I don't know if you know of babae kasi, ah, because it's a woman driver. So these are the different biases that women uh, undergo. But I'd like to just focus on those that pertain to public transportation. And therefore, I'd like to focus on spaces for luggages, step boards for, 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 right, for getting on and getting off, as well as the risk of physical, harass, of, of physical harassment. You know, it's not just women who experience physical harassment on public transportation. A, a survey that my colleagues and I, I belong to the Women in Transport Leadership Network. It's a, an a Australia, it's an Asian Australia network, which looks at gender issues in transport. In 2018, we ran a survey for university students and we found out that 137 out of 316 respondents experienced sexual harassment. Of these groups, of this group, 51% were female, 32% were male, and 15% belonged to the LGBTQI group. So it's really not just the purview of women who are harassed. Now, 
looking at that, so I cannot just, you know, when I talk about gender issues, uh, sometimes I'd have to meander and I'd probably go to accessibility issues because those are related, right? But having said that, how do we then, from the perspective of the agency, how we then, what are our intervention? Although a lot of people are always saying it should be gender equality. But my point is gender equality, equal, equal access to opportunities, but equity considerations in public transportation planning. Why is that important? It's important because equity means you give to that group of vulnerable uh, stakeholders what they need. All right, so why public transportation? Well, we all know that no? so, uh, public transportation serves an important role in providing affordable mobility again across social and economic spectrum. Uh, goal 11.2 acknowledges the role of transport in making cities and human settlements inclusive, safe, resilient, and uh, sustainable. So what do we then do? What are our interventions considering that we have all these issues in public transportation? I won't go into this, but one of the key pro pro programs of the Department of Transportation is a public utility vehicle modernization program. Unfortunately, a lot of people think that this is really just about jeepney modernization, but it is not. It is more than that. It's actually a program that seeks to overhaul. It seeks to improve the public transportation system. Right to, to look at how this can be more accessible, more inclusive uh, for everyone to use. So I'm not gonna go into that. I was told I only have a minute left of my five minute allocation. So uh, uh, it actually also uh, looks at, I, I'd like to just um, direct your attention to the CCTV, GPS and dashboard camps. Because when we did a focus group discussions, a lot of women, and, and mind you, remember I told you that a lot of women experience harassment also inside the vehicle. So they actually find it uh, more reassuring if there are CCTVs and cameras inside the vehicles. So part of the modernization of the PUVMP of the Philippines is really to improve the quality of the vehicles such that we would have all those safety precautions, right? We are now, another thing is during the pandemic, despite the fact that we tried to make our public transportation safer, we all know that a lot of people veered away from public transportation, used their private vehicle, but an opportunity actually came up during the pandemic, and this is the promotion of walking and our, it's called active transport walking or cycling. So in the department, we, because of the pandemic, we are now um, moving forward for the, into, uh, well, the construction of protected bike lanes on EDSA as part of our response to this pandemic, because you know people do not want to use public transport regardless of how you make it safe. So they would rather use the, you know, they would rather cycle or bike to work, all right. An important consideration in the inclusive transport unit, which I, which is under the uh, planning and project development is the recognition of intersectionality of concerns. Women with limited mobility is also important, right? Um, and right now we are also looking at, uh, we're changing paradigms. When we look at gender issues, we, I, in fact, earlier somebody mentioned that, you know, harassment does, doesn't just happen inside the vehicle. It can also happen at stations while walking to the stations. So a change in paradigm in the department right now is looking at accessible journey cycles, which looks at even transport, you know, planning your trip until you get to the destination. So we are, you know, we are putting that into our, planning considerations, right? And um, important, another important consideration is being conscious of our unconscious bias. You know, a lot of us work in, in gender and development, a lot of us work for accessibility, but a lot of us also are not aware that we do have unconscious bias against the 
um, vulnerable sectors. It's very important for us also in the department to address our unconscious bias. In fact, an we are now embarking on putting together an accessibility manual, which does not just look at people with disability, but pe uh, you know, indigenous people, those with uh, limited mobility would have difficulty in moving and uh, using transportation, right? And moving forward also, we are now looking at, uh, we are now mainstreaming doing gap gender and development audits for planning and implementation, as well as mainstreaming gender issues in the nationally determined contributions for the department. We submitted, the department submitted in 2019 four programs, which we unconditionally commit to lower the carbon footprint. And three of these are actually public transportation projects. Now uh, we are working on mainstreaming gender issues in the uh, NDCs, right? Another, of course, another way forward is the use of technology. We're now leveraging technology to use public transport for people who may have difficulty accessing public transportation. In fact, I was gonna say, we, we use safety pin uh, in the Philippines. We use it a lot, uh, but we use it a lot for pedestrians, right? Uh, and I, we like the concept of the windows as the eyes to the world. As on my final slide, I think I'm over by two minutes, but as a final slide in the Philippines, we're working towards making public transportation move towards affording dignity of travel to everybody. Thank you, everybody. I'd, I'd, I'd like, I can now entertain questions. Thank you so much, Asik. Maraming salamat po. I think my um, my intervention, my direct question to you will be a flip of what I asked an Anish. So I asked Anish like what, what, how can stakeholders help young people? But I guess for you, we would ask how can young people support their governments, the UN, um, especially young people were known to be innovators and providers, implementers of technology, technical solutions. Um, for instance, in our Move Her campaign, we promote the use of e-tricycles. It's a smaller version of the EG piece, and we encourage more women to own and drive their own e-tricycles. So I, so I guess my question to you is how, first and foremost, can we as young, young entrepreneurs support you and at the same time be mindful of um, all these nexuses like catering to different um, genders and at the same time also different gender, uh, different ethnic ethnic groups because I can imagine for our indigenous communities there will be a gap when it comes to technology. So how do we bridge those different gaps? Okay, uh, I'd answer you in three points. One, how do we encourage our youth? We uh, The department actually, uh, and we do a lot of consultations. We interact a lot with groups, young groups like alt mobility, people who are passionate about cycling, people are passionate about the environment. And we just don't interact with them. We also uh, work with them in crafting guidelines. For instance, in the guidelines for the bike bikeways, we worked with a young group. I, I, we consider them young group because it's, you know, there's a lot of, uh, what do you call this, a young people? Ah, young people. Okay, the second one is um, uh, how, 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 how will the, those who are technical, technology savvy, okay. The department has what we call the free rides for health workers. This is a, a, a service that the department run has been running since the start of the pandemic. To help us, we have tapped into a group I forgot the name of the group because I have a, an app called sakai.ph, which enables health workers to know where's the station, what time is the bus coming in. So we work with them as well. And uh, the department recently launched in uh, the service contracting, which uh, pays jeepneys um, using vehicle kilometers instead of the number of passengers that they carry. We also use a lot of technology there. And we tap young groups uh, for this. I hope I answered the question, Regine. Yes, thank you so much, Asik. I'm going to give the floor to my colleague, Lander, maybe to entertain other questions for other panelists as well, maybe Asik. 
Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Regina. Thank you very much, Assistant uh, Secretary. That was very interesting uh, indeed to hear that, uh, that voice from, from the authorities, let's say. And I think it shows uh, the diversity of the panel today that we had the activists, we had the experts, and we have the, uh, the authorities present. And it's exactly the kind of discussion I think that, uh, that needs to be had. Um, the part of that discussion is, of course, also the audience. Um, I see that we've had a very good attendance on, on our Facebook Live as well. Uh, unfortunately, those people will not be uh, able to ask any questions, but there have been questions coming into the Q&A box uh, on Zoom. Um, and some of our participants have been answering them uh, already uh, in the chat. So if you want to have a look at all of them, you can see them in the Q&A box together with the answers. I'm going to pick just a few out uh, to be answered uh, uh, live. Uh, and maybe one, one for the young uh, climate activists. Uh, the last question that came in, um, maybe Chie or, or, or Dia, you can, you can take this one. Uh, if, you're, if you're still with us, um, uh, is seeing the challenge and the issues of moving around in your local environment. What would you like your society and your government to do to make a change in the right direction? What concretely would you like to see uh, uh, your, your government uh, uh, do um, to tackle these challenges? Um, well, something that I can see in New York City is that a lot of the um, pollution that comes from public transportation, specifically buses, is concentrated uh, near schools. And we have gone to representatives to ask if there is a way to minimize the pollution that affects, um, um, you know, just centers where there's not only a lot of schools and school children, but also a lot of people who go to work in general. And they always say, oh, you have to take it up to the state, like the city can't do much. And I think that um, that's something that we would like to see changed also, like what can we do so that um, we can form our city the way we want it to look like without having to go to the bigger government because at the end of the day, uh, the city is where, where we live every day and what we're affected by. Um, and, you know, I've been biking also every day for like the past, I don't know how long, and just the biking lanes need to be just better uh, in general. I think that's uh, a really big uh, plus. Uh, we already have public bikes. I don't know if they're public, but you can, you know, uh, put something in your phone and then you you can get them for like 30 minutes, uh, which I think is a really good system. But we also need to definitely make uh, just biking safer um, for youth who want to go to school on bikes or for people who want to go to work in bikes. So. Those are two things that I would say uh, I would like to see changed in cities. Fantastic, uh, thanks for that, Shi. And I think that's a very practical recommendation as well uh, that can be taken forward uh, and discussed. So that, thank you, thank you for those insights. Um, a question from, from Gretchen, maybe for the experts uh, and, and government representatives uh, on our panel um, about uh, whether it's possible to find big companies and work with them so that employees, for instance, get a pay rise when they use public transport or the bicycle to go to work. Uh, following up as well on what she had just said. Um, would that reduce the impact from private cars blocking uh, blocking the streets every day and, and pollution of the planet? Is that something um, to the experts and, and, and potentially you as well, uh, Assistant Secretary, that can be considered such a model? Okay, I'll go ahead. Um, well, we are already considering that model. We already have, as part of a project for the department, we have a bike share program, right? Uh, so that people are encouraged to use, uh, to use to cycle rather than use their cars. But see, the problem is bigger than having available bicycles. I think the problem is a changing of the mindset. Until such time, we're able to promote cycling and public transportation as an attractive alternative to private vehicle. That's going to be an uphill climb, right? Uh, Parking is a problem as well, because I think one of the things that works against us is the concept in the Philippines of what you call parking minimums, right? Uh, so that means if you have this big building, you ought to have this number of parking places, but it ought to be parking maximums. Why? So that we, it's counterintuitive. If you don't have any place to park, you'd have to think of other ways to get to where you need to go, right? So I think it's not just a one solution for removing the cars blocking the streets when they park. 
Um, I'd also like to jump in here actually and just add an example. I, I absolutely agree with what you've said. It is a change in mindset. You know, people have to want to use their spaces and not just their private cars. And actually in India, we have, there's an organization called the Rahagiri Foundation, where what they do is they, on Sundays, they close out some parts of the street and make it only available for pedestrians which then promotes more people to use it and people come out and their activities. And actually now that the foundation has grown in such a way that they are working with the municipal corporations to actually make more green belts around um, you know, the city. So they're like increasing their cycle lanes, they're having like tactile paving so that you know, people know where to walk and how to use it. So I think initiatives where people can see how the streets can be used without cars will promote them to use it that way more. Um, you know, more than monetary benefits at some point, I think. I don't, I don't think that's sustainable in the long term. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. And I see that there is quite a lot of questions on this, on this issue of, of uh, non-motorized transport, of cycling, of road safety, uh, and of how that can work in practice. So, so I hope that that, uh, that that answers some of those questions in the chats as well. Um, if, if participants or panelists uh, feel like answering another question as well in writing, uh, please, uh, please, please feel free to do so in the Q&A box. Uh, maybe a final question before we go to the uh, closing uh, from, from the audience um, is, is a question for Shia, but I'm sure that that opens up to, to other climate activists uh, and, and experts and, and government representatives as well. Uh, as an active cyclist, how do you think that we can encourage more people to cycle? What do you think is the main obstacle, maybe in your own local context, and maybe we can have a bit of a, a discussion wrapping up uh, on, on that aspect of a local context. What do you think is the main obstacle in your city, uh, in the place where you live, to, to cycling and to active transport? Oh, well, I actually have a funny story for that. The other day I was biking uh, down Central Park and, you know, someone stopped me, someone from public service, and they gave me a flyer that said the benefits of cycling. And I thought, well, I'm already cycling, so this is actually not useful for me, but you could hand it to people who are walking. So I think that there's, you know, this, um, you know, this connect between trying to encourage people who cycle already to cycle when that is already happening. But how do we actually get people who are who have not maybe gained the confidence to do it or maybe you know, cycling in the city is a lot different than cycling when, where I grew up in like a town where there are not many cars and there's a lot of places to go. And, you know, it's more like an activity uh, to do and rather than looking at it as a way of transportation. And if you are, you know, an aspiring cyclist, I would just say go for it. It's super fun. Um, that's how I intake my dose of nature every day. You know, I think that we can also see it that way. It's a way to connect with your city, a way to connect with nature, a way to uh, get away from the screen for a while. So it, it brings a lot of benefits. It brings health benefits. Um, and so I think what we can do to encourage cycling is look at it as a holistic act, not only like a transportation act, but also it encourages you to go outside, encourages you to breathe fresh air, um, and actually be in touch with your city and know more and get to know your city better. So, you know, just communicate it in that way um, rather than just, you know, there, there will be less cars or something, you know, something that appeals to people in a deeper way. Fantastic. Would anyone else like to jump in there and uh, share their view and, uh, and experience? Um, I would like to jump in and maybe answer it in a local way how I would how I would do it here in my country, Uganda. Um, in my country there's a lot of motorcycles than cars. So the only way we can promote cycling in my country is by banning motorcycles, which will reduce on the congestion in the country and give more space for people to, you know, cycle and by the bicycles and also maybe reduce on the prices for the public transport which will also help in promoting public transport fantastic thanks for that thanks for that leah um and uh, i noticed that we're going slightly over time uh, which i think is a reflection of the interesting discussion and the, the various uh, perspectives that we had uh today um, so uh, if there's any of the panelists who wants to jump in at this point, uh, please feel free. Otherwise, I suggest we move on to our uh, closing remarks uh, from one of the co-organizers 
uh, the Friends for Leadership. Uh, and then uh, after that, we'll show the outcome statements of, of our event, which we'd like to share with you and which will be uh, made public as well. Um, so if there is no interruption, I would like to pass it on to Regine to introduce our uh, closing uh, remarks. Regine, uh, if you can hear us, uh, the floor is yours to, to lead us through the final session uh, of today. Of course, I'm happy to. I have here with us uh, my colleague, Sharifa Nariza, who's also from Major Group for Children and Youth and Friends for Leadership. Um, Friends for Leadership is an in international network of next generation young leaders and also entrepreneurs, innovators across the SDGs. So we have Friends of Cities. And Sharifa has followed up on that a few times too when she was in World Urban Forum and so on and so forth. I'm sure she can explain more about that. Um, Sharifa, would you like to deliver our um, closing remarks, maybe a recap call to action? Thank you so much, Regine. Uh, sorry for joining, uh, just joining this session, but I believe uh, all the speakers already highlighted the important points uh, for this topic. <clears throat> As for the closing reminder, so intervention, I just want to talk a little bit on uh, some other areas that maybe we need to highlight. It's about culture and innovation. Uh, for, for me, like uh, culture and innovation must take uh, in inclusivity into consideration as well. Uh, maybe from starting from the urban planner, from the urban planning, the youth representative must be included as well uh, to make sure that uh, the discussion with the municipality and also local, local government will take uh, important uh, key area. For example, uh, what are the young people need? What are, what are the women need? What are the uh, marginalized group needs uh, and also innovation and technology have to be transactional and also uh, across gen across generation and it must be intergenerational uh, not only to meet the modern modernization objective but also to think on the resilience issue what to expect for example if there is no commuter in certain areas how, how the young people uh, need to be independent without technology and then uh, we need to also think about the accessibility aspect uh, for the uh, young people, also uh, the women, especially, for example, for them to get uh, to the education, uh, for the education purpose, how they want to go to work, how they want to go to the, to the school, for example. And also, uh, I think we need to always think about the safety when we talk about the marginalized group, especially uh, when we talk about young women, uh, young people and also women, so the other marginalized group, uh, in terms of public transport, it is very important also to highlight the safety uh, for them. In certain countries, maybe they provide a special coach uh, for the commuter, for example, or maybe uh, the MRT or other, other uh, public transport like train, uh, and also even, even the public transport like Grab or maybe Uber or other uh, public transport that always been used by the young people and also uh, women uh, in that aspect. So I think I don't know if Regine can hear us. It's been remarkable uh, today. It's, yes. uh, for such a global event, uh, the quality of, of both sound and uh, and uh, has been amazing. Uh, Regine, are you are you still with us? Yes. Sorry, just a short technical glitch. Yes, Lander, where were we? Great. So uh, I see that you have shared our, uh, our outcome statement um, and uh, we, we are not going to uh, make you stay for another hour to walk you through all the pages of this, of this document. Um, uh, the, 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 the panelists and the speakers and the, the organizing, uh, okay, the co-organizers of this session um, uh, have, have drawn up together uh, a, a call to action um, on, on both communities and, and organizations. Uh, and, and local and national governments, um, addressing the topics that were uh, discussed today. Um, 
and this will be made uh, made available uh, as well via UN Habitat uh, and and other uh, co-organizing organizations. Uh, and this is this is meant to be a living document. Uh, this is meant to be based on discussion from today uh, a, a way forward of how we can really take the young female and the young indigenous voice uh, into account in our urban planning uh, and in in the development of cities. Um, so what I was strongly recommend, we'll, we'll make this available later on, and we'd really love to hear your inputs to all of those joining us today, whether it's via the Facebook, whether it's via uh, Zoom, um, and to hear from you on how, uh, what, what do you think you took away from this session, what you think uh, can feed into this, uh, into this uh, outcome document. Um, so that to wrap up the discussion, um, personally from my side, before I pass on to Regine for the very final uh, uh, remarks, I'd like to thank all of our speakers, all of our panelists, uh, for what I think is a fascinating discussion. I think we heard from a, a large a diversity of, of, of backgrounds and, and fields of expertise. Um, I definitely learned a lot. I hope everybody who joined us did as well. Um, so thank you to all of our fantastic speakers. Thank you to the co-organizers, um, you know, for, from UN Habitat to the co-organizing organizations with us. Uh, thank you as well to the Republic of the Philippines and the Permanent Mission for supporting uh, this event. It's greatly appreciated. Um, and uh, that's it for me, Regine. Uh, if you would like to do the honors, of no, not not too much. I just wanted to echo your gratitude. Thank you so much to you and Habitat and Lander. You know, we organized this, planned this for about two to three months. <laughs> uh, and thank you also to Dog and Olga and um, the rest of the UN Habitat crew, and also of course the permanent mission of Philippines to the UN Department of Transportation, all of their youth speakers. As Doug previously mentioned, you know, transport isn't really um, a thoroughly discussed topic in the ur wider urban discussion, but also especially in intergenerational, interregional discussions. But I think it's really important for us, like when we were discussing among the constituencies in the major group and different youth orgs, like Friends for Leadership, because it's a doorway to social inclusion, like mobility opens opportunities to education, to employment, and so on and so forth. So thank you once again for supporting our advocacy, and we hope to keep in touch with the outcome statement and all of the follow-ups. Thank you very much. Hi, dog. Hi. Yeah, just really quickly. Sorry, I mean, I've been watching. It's been amazing. Um, so we have many different... <laughs> um, uh, events going on right now. So it's really exciting to see so many people speak. But I just also wanted to do a big shout out um, to the young women that spoke here who spoke so passionately about climate change and stuff. Chie, who has done some amazing, amazing work and uh, continues to do it. And Leah uh, from Uganda, who's also doing some stuff. And then Lucipia, which I can't say, I don't think I can pronounce her name too. I mean, he's nine years old and blows everyone away. I think it's it's important as a as a UN agency, but also important for us globally to really listen to young people, but also listen to young women, um, because young women often times are forgotten, um, and especially and then adding to that, young Indigenous women who are not only forgotten but face horrific and horrible violence in their communities and inability to to um, all the issues that we brought up around access to transportation and what that means linking to, to jobs and education and such. Um, I think it's a criti that critical corridor to all the things you do in life. So again, just big thanks to everyone and all the other speakers too. I'm not trying to, to elevate others over whatever, but I think it's just really great that we're able to, to bring this diversity to the table. And thank you so much for doing that. Thank you very much. And on that note, I think we'll close the session for today. Big thanks once more uh, from our side and uh, we hope to keep in touch and to see you very soon uh, and that this topic is taken forward. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Stay safe everyone and stay passionate.